We have some amazing news. The Build By Me podcast is hitting the road. We're going to be at the huge convention August 23rd to 24th in Nashville this year. We'll be interviewing some amazing people in the industry live at the show. So come visit us at the Nice Job booth. We'd love to see you. Four key ingredients allows us to say, okay, well, growth isn't that hard. Uh, we can make growth predictable and we can make lead acquisition profitable. Um, and so that formula, my experience was this. Um, I, at the very least say, you should go give them a try. And that's all we're looking for with reviews. I think it's important to look at um, the channels that you have in your digital marketing mix uh, as playing different roles uh, on the same team. If you've got a hundred bucks in a month, go get a nice job. Shameless plug, but like that, that's the first thing is go get more reviews. In the beginning, every single person's content is terrible. I mean, it is just awful. And when you, the more you do it, like you just perfect the craft and perfecting the craft doesn't look the same as everybody else's, but you get better at it over time. So you got to start. Welcome back to the Built by Me podcast. Today, we're chatting with Ross McDaniel, a growth marketer who's passionate about seeing human flourishing through business growth. His company, Fence Post, helps home service business providers generate more high quality customers. So things like roofers, electrician, lawn care professionals, etc. These are the backbones to our local economy. So he helps those businesses get more high quality leads and five star reviews. So it's only fitting that we chat to Ross all about marketing and SEO and how that can help you grow your business. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Yeah, let's just get going. So today we want to talk about all things uh, marketing, right? Uh, marketing is not just becoming, but I, I guess it's already has become a crucial element for any service-based business. Um, it's what can really take, I guess, a business from good to great. It's it's and it's also you know having an online presence now is no longer a nice to have. I believe it's it's becoming more and more necessary. So I want us to spend time, you know, unpacking a little bit this topic around marketing and diving into the whole world behind it, but also talking about things like SEO and, and, and Google ads and Facebook ads. But I guess more so I want to talk about, you know, how businesses these days can't really rely on just being fully booked up through referrals um, and, and, and that old traditional kind of style of marketing. So I think marketing is now playing a more pivotal role in sustaining the growth of businesses. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad we got we got Ross joining us today to kind of help us navigate these waters. Yeah, thank you for being on Built by Me, Ross. We're so happy to have you. You own a marketing agency that primarily focuses on you know home service providers and businesses. So I'm sure you have a ton of value to add to this conversation. Uh, so thank you for being on. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on. Being in the home service space, uh, I feel like the black sheep sometimes, me and my crew, because we're not really one of one of us, right? But <laughs> but we are because we are in it with the roofers, the HVAC companies, uh, the plumbers, the electricians. Um, we're in it with with you guys, with with all of us, um, each and every day. And Mo, I thought your point before you, you just can't rely on um, word of mouth anymore. Um, that's a critical part, but there's so much more to it. Yeah, absolutely. I want to start, I want to start by doing a little bit of a story, I guess. So some story, a little, little story time here. Story um, time, so Ross, here's something, here's something that, uh, here's something I experienced recently and I found, I found quite interesting and I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on it. So I was, I was, you know, I was looking to get a concrete pad actually poured in my backyard. So I was doing a little bit of, um, backyard upgrade work, I guess you can call it. So I did the the typical thing that I think most people do is, you know, you'll reach out to a few buddies that are close to you and say, hey, anyone know anyone? Anyone got a concrete guy that or a concrete person or business that they know? Um, and, you know, you get, you'll get all these different referrals coming through. And, you know, sometimes you might get the same referral, like the same person being referred, which I did in my scenario. So you can say each, each friend of mine kind of gave two or three references, right? And then I obviously reached out, did the classic thing of contacting, saying, hey, would love for you to kind of come out and give me a quote um, to see what something like this would cost. Um, so after that kind of stage, you know, I got all the quotes, narrowed it down to a few folks. And I, I, and what, I would, what I was trying to do throughout the whole process is I was trying to keep like a mental um, note of how I'm going through my decision-making process, if you will. 
So it came down to two businesses, looked at them. They both had really good quotes, very similar in price. Um, very nice people kind of kind of came out, gave me their business card. So then I went, checked out their websites, started reading more of the online reviews. Because even though like my friends referred them, I still wanted to get some more validation from others, right? And what I found so interesting was it came down to one of the businesses actually had a ton of content on social media. So they had a lot of like videos and pictures and past projects that they were sharing on TikTok and Instagram. And I was like, this is amazing. I can actually see work that's that's been done by these folks. And then people that that I don't know actually leaving comments and and and, and you know um, liking the liking the posts. So what I found interesting is that although all these businesses came from like really close friends of mine as referrals, you know, what I what I the one I actually ended up going with was the one who had a stronger online presence. So I wanna kinda ask you, like, how important do you think marketing and maintaining an online presence is for the home service provider that's already being fully booked or, you know, is relying on referrals and word of mouth? Yeah, I mean the short answer is it is of the utmost importance, right? And I think that I mean, we shouldn't just say that as a blanket statement for all of time. That's been the case because it truly hasn't. I think up to this point or, or up until several years ago, I mean, you really could rely on the tried and true, been in business 25 years. Um, Cousin Joe said that this guy yeah. is the best. Um, they've got three Google reviews, but they're all five stars. We trust them <laughs> yeah. um, and they're going to come out. I think that that worked really well, but what we've seen now is we've got the great retirement happening. Uh, we've got, That's what, right. I think something like 70 billion or something that could be off by zero. I don't know, but some astronomical number of assets that are owned by um, this boomer generation being now like transferred in either a sale or um, being inherited down, passed down. And so these businesses, um, are, they don't have the same clout and reputation. And beyond that, so many new players are entering into the space. And so like you, Mo, I mean, you had a couple of different options. Yes, they came highly reputed, um, highly referred, there you mm -hmm. go. but at the same time, there, there are all these other options clouding our, our consumer journey or your, your decision-making process. And I think us um, as this millennial generation and then the next couple of generations underneath us, I mean, we are accustomed to not only having a bunch of choices, but really requiring a certain level of trust and connection. Even if we were, it's just a transactional relationship, we still want to have some level of trust and relationship with that, that transaction. And so having an online presence can separate you from the competition and then begin to build that, that handshake that, that's required to actually do business. Yeah, because actually what's interesting is the, the it, w it's, it was a father and son that came and it was clearly the, the father was handing the keys over and, and you can tell the father is not on social media at all, right? So he's sure. like, his son's taking pictures and his dad's just in the background. He's like, I'm, I'm basically retired. Like I'm one foot in, one foot out. So you can see the son understanding the business. And I, and I actually had a conversation with him about it. I said, you know, how are you doing things differently? And he's like, well, he's like, we've always used to rely on just our reputation. And he's like, it's not the case anymore because he's like in the service industry, in the service based like industry, it's like you have these high and low moments, right? That you might, you might kind of do a job and a neighbor walks by and says, Hey, can you come and quote me? And like, it kind of, you know, you get that neighborhood effect, but you're going to come across a time where you're not going to get as much business consistently going. So There's so many options. Yeah. yeah, there's so many options out there. Exactly. And that was the hardest part of choosing a, a, a person. I was like, I can't believe how many, how much competition there is out there for, for one job, really. Right. So, yeah, I think for many of us, when we need a service done, we just go to Google, right? We go to Google, we look at the, the first five that we see and we, we call them all and just compare pricing after that, right? So you look at the reviews, which is why yeah. local SEO, um, and for those listening who don't know what SEO is, search engine optimization, it's basically how your, your keywords on your website and your online presence that help you show up on search engines. So it helps you with your visibility and you're listed higher up. Um, 
So basically, I just look at the first five. I look at the whoever's on there. I look at whatever service I need to be done. And those are the people who I'm going to call. So local SEO is very crucial for home services. Uh, so what are some specific actions that you think businesses can take to improve their SEO? I think both of you started with, I mean, outside of like the referral um, step of that um, customer journey, both of you mentioned Google as being a big, a big component. And mm -hmm. at least for us at Fence Post, we're talking about what is the local growth formula to make business growth for home service, both predictable and profitable. Well, the very first ingredient is visibility mm -hmm. and we have to show up where our customers are and yeah. when they are searching for us. And that, that just means Google, right? I, I think the very first thing that you can do when trying to make yourself more visible, when trying to make your business show up on Google is just go claim your Google business listing. I mean, I'm shocked at how massive some of the companies that come across our plate are that just, they, they've never even looked to do this. The aforementioned, you know, business that's been in existence for 25 years, they just haven't. The word of mouth is is too strong and it's mm -hmm. starting to wane. And that's why they're even coming to a company like Fence Post or whatever other marketing agency out there is because they're seeing this wane. And so we have to just go claim a Google business listing, have a website that's not awful. Um, <laughs> those are the two lowest hanging fruit, fruit yeah. action steps. And keep it updated. I think a lot of times they don't update their locations, mm. their hours, or even services that they provide. And it's like, okay, we can just keep this updated so that people know what you're offering, what you, what you, what you can do. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, we've been privileged to be able to, to launch a, a coffee shop just, um, as a, as a passion project for where we live in our community. We live in Augusta, Georgia. It's a small, probably small, but mid market size, um, city, uh, in the Southeastern United States. And, um, we love our community and trellis coffee bar was a great way we could partner up with some of our neighbors and actually test out this local growth formula that we talked about at Fence post and mm -hmm. man, is it hard to take your own medicine? Uh, <laughs> me being the one hammering home, you've got to keep your Google business listing updated. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And like the first problem we ran into was making sure our varying hours were consistent and updated across the board. Um, but it's so easy to do. Yeah, I'm with you, Tanya. What is this local growth formula? Simplifying it down, um, it, it being growth, right? Wow. What we want to do is we want to take all these big, um, big principles, big strategies that we see that these enterprise level companies doing um, across the U.S. and across the world. Uh, we've recognized that they still apply here at the local level. And so simplifying them down and distilling them down into four key ingredients allows us to say, okay, well, growth isn't that hard. Uh, we can make growth predictable and we can make lead acquisition profitable. Um, and so that formula may look tactically different for each, each different business, but strategically it's all the same. It's a visibility. You've got to show up when your customers are looking for you and where they're looking for you. Uh, competency ingredient number two, you've got to be as good or better than the competition. Truly. I mean, you, you just, the par is just as good. Um, that, mm -hmm. that's all that's required to stay in business is just as good as the next, next competitor. Um, third ingredient would be social proof. Uh, that's something that we all love, uh, in, in this world, right. Is collecting reviews and the more five-star reviews we can get, um, just the more reviews in general that we can get, uh, the, the more likely we will be to, to generate an, an extra, extra business deal, um, as a result. And then the fourth ingredient is referral. And the reason this is part of this is because it is timeless. It's tried and true. Uh, we don't believe that you can really succeed without having some version of all four of these. Um, I, I do think some matter and, and weigh more heavily in the formula than the others. But this referral component is kind of the cornerstone where ultimately we want to have the Chick-fil-A effect. After all these other ingredients are in place, we do want your business to get back to that referral level, that word of mouth being just viral and rampant level. Yeah, no, it's very, it's, it's, it's really interesting. You talk about, um, you mentioned obviously reviews and I think people downplay like how important reviews are for your business. And it's kind of like that one forgotten thing that you tend to forget to ask for or forget to actually get. But why, why in your opinion are our customer reviews so important? Like now more than ever for home service businesses and yeah, maybe similar, like what, what kind of strategies do you think? Um, 
can encourage customers to leave reviews? Yeah, great questions. Uh, it, at its core, a review is just a digital version of um, somebody giving a public endorsement for an interaction they had with the business. Um, and we as humans, uh, dating back to like MySpace, Facebook, wh whatever else, right? Like that was the original social network. And we just thrived off of these interactions um, that we were getting. And like, we, that's really how we learned our environment and society and in this new digital world is what other people were saying about what experiences they were having. And both of you mentioned in separate um, anecdotes, how at different stages of your own journey, Google played a, an important role. And if Google's not your flavor, like out in the West coast, they're big Yelp fans, big, big Yelp fans for some reason. It's wild, but that's where they go as part of their buying decision. And so for us, uh, when we're going to make a make a decision, if, if a business doesn't have a substantial amount of reviews, not even a substantial amount, if they um, if they don't have reviews that are weighty enough and, and accurately reflect somebody's very individualized experience with the business, people will just scroll on through. We see this a lot, even with companies that have like 25 star reviews, they might not get as long of a look as the company with 124.8 star reviews, mm -hmm. right? And so I think for us, we're looking for uh, us being consumers, we're looking for authenticity uh, and, and endorsement. And that social proof component is the signal that says, hey, my experience was this. Um, I, at the very least, say you should go give them a try. And that's all we're looking for with reviews. Mm -hmm. So that's the importance of them. I think on the, on the other side of like, how do we get more of those? I mean, the first step is just asking. I think that's where a lot of business owners, especially maybe more blue collar business owners that don't have time to worry about all the digital stuff or the online stuff, uh, but simplifying it down even further is just go ask. You know, we all know a great tool that helps us do that. And nice job has been just an incredible resource for Finspos and all of our clients because it makes it easy to automate that review collection process. But that's the number one thing we tell everybody is, Hey, you don't want to invest in something funky or technical or automated. That's fine. But after every point you shake somebody's hand and hand them their invoice, go ahead and ask them for a five-star review. Mm -hmm. Just ask. Yeah. I feel like in many ways, reviews are like, our modern way of just asking your buddy. I know we also do that as well, just asking people around us, but because society these days is a lot more individual, everyone is mm. kind of to themselves. Like, I don't really know my neighbors, but I live like in an apartment building, right? So like, I don't really know all my neighbors. So when I want to get something or or have a home service provider or something like that, I just go on Google and I look to reviews and basically are trusting the strangers to be like my friends and family to tell me how their experience was because that's what I would normally have done back in the day. But now it's like all online because you might not know someone who has had a carpet cleaning mm -hmm. or a window washing because you know maybe you're the first one of your friend group to do that in that area good point that's, that's such amazing. a great point because you're, you're almost delegating the authority that a a trusted friend or family member would have you're delegating that to google in exactly. that instance yeah, yeah so that's, that's a great point not just like having the five stars but also having like words and like a story makes people Substance. trust the business more exactly because it's like okay it was five stars but why or it was three stars mm. but why and then when they explain you can kind of you're it's like you were there with them and you're like okay i understand why you left that review especially exactly especially right. if the person like referring didn't actually like get the job done on their place you know what i mean like so like that's <laughs> Going back to my example, none of my friends actually had concrete work. They're like, I know this person or that oh, okay. person, but I didn't actually fit. So that maybe that's what also it's drove really me cool. to like, let me see what the reviews look like online, right? To see if this is actually like a legit business. But um, yeah, it's it's yeah, I'm with you. It's changing pretty fast. So so that's that's reviews. I think I think on the flip side, then it's you know getting more exposure is is another thing um, that business needs to do. Then in term, in terms of generating those leads and getting more business coming through and. And, you know, Google ads and, and, and Facebook marketing, all these things kind of have a, have a play into it. But specifically with Google, how, how would you say, like, how do you leverage Google ads to kind of get more leads for your home service business, right? Do you have any tips or, or any, any, any ideas around how, how business owners can optimize their campaigns to kind of get more, more leads? Yeah, I, I think if you're, if you're in the DIY camp and you want to in-house this and you want to do it on your own, um, simpler is better. You can very quickly 
spread your budgets way too thin. Um, whether it's Google ads, Facebook ads, something else, pick a channel and validate it first. Um, and then within that channel, pick a strategy and validate it first and then move on to the next one. Um, you know, we, we have the local growth formula. It is slightly different for each and every one of our clients, but at the end of the day, our playbooks specifically on Google ads, which is our bread and butter, I mean, that they, they're largely similar. Um, can you be similar without having a cookie cutter approach? I think so. I mean, I want our trellis cookie to be exactly the same every time because it's incredible. Um, it's similar with this. And so our, our typical playbook is we want to make sure that we have, um, you know, a core service, uh, as a primary ad group within a primary non-branded campaign. Uh, we want the primary conversion action to be a phone call over 60 seconds. And we want to make sure that we're call, um, tracking and recording those phone calls that come in. And so at a base level, you need to have your core service in a pretty tight, tightly targeted um, world and optimizing for phone calls and recording those phone calls so you can evaluate effectiveness. Um, there's mm. way more to it, but at the end of the day, keep it narrow, keep it focused, make sure you're recording those calls. Yeah. That's so tangible. I think a lot of times like business owners, they're intimidated to start getting on Google or Facebook ads because they're competing with these like big brands or um, maybe franchisees that have like a bigger budget because their marketing is a little bit, they have a higher budget in general. So it's good that you said, you know, pick a platform, stick to it, validate it. And then as that's working, then you can, you can expand. And it's just, instead of putting you know, spreading yourself too thin and you can put your eggs in one basket in a way and just kind of like play around there and then you can go from there. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the, sometimes the temptation I've been guilty of this too in my own ventures, but sometimes the temptation is like FOMO. Well, what if this mm. could also work and we want to, we want to learn fast. Well, if you want to learn fast, you got to have a lot of money. If you don't have a lot of money, you got to learn slow. And that's really it, learning is a function of time and money. Um, I think something else to think about is that uh, when you're looking at Google, there's a whole suite of products. Um, typically we don't recommend, you know, like the Google smart ads or anything like that, but I think Google guaranteed Google local services ads for these um, home service businesses that maybe don't have a ton of budget and are not ultra technically savvy. It's a great way for them to enter into the space and just show up. Like a lot of times um, for reference, these Google guaranteed ads are the little square ads at the top of a Google search, just above the maps. They have the little green check mark on them. I mean, this is a great way to do some virtue signaling, um, get some authority in the space. Even if people don't click on it, um, you're still signaling those things. Um, and it's also a good way to not blow all your money while still getting to play in the, in the game. So what make, what do you think makes, you know, Facebook lead generation ads? And you said you also like tracking the calls and things like that. What do you think makes that effective for home service businesses? And how do you tailor these to attract the right kind of customer and not just wasting your money on just everyone who can see it? Yeah, I think it's important to look at um, the channels that you have in your digital marketing mix uh, as playing different roles uh, on the same team. Uh, what I mean by different roles is um, different tactics are going to have different impact at different stages of the funnel. I use different like seven times. There. <laughs> uh, but if we're looking at Facebook, typically we're going, you know, a step higher in the customer journey um, in the steps taken that a customer takes to actually like complete a purchase with you, the home service business, you know, seeing a Facebook ad is probably um, further back in the funnel than something like Google ads, where they are specifically looking for your product or service. Yeah. And so when we're running Facebook ads, Facebook lead gen, we really have to have something of value, something of, of meaning and impact to exchange um, in return for their information. Um, that could be a free quote or a free estimate. Uh, it could be actually like a I don't know, like a, an explainer on why spray foam is the best thing in the world. And here's your cost calculator on how much it's actually going to be. Mm -hmm. You can get it right here, right now. Just give us your email. Mm -hmm. um, some level of a value exchange is necessary there because you're just courting at that point. You're just, you know, it's the initial handshake. We're not actually digging into to a relationship at this point. Um, and then on the flip side, if we're maybe foregoing that, we are going for a more direct deal. Uh, we just have to know that any calls we get directly from an ad, it's probably going to be some tire kickers and we need to pay less for those uh, going for a volume play. Interesting. 
So Ross, you've been doing this for quite some time, right? Like you've been, you've, you, I believe you have almost like a decade worth of, of experience of, 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 you know, digital advertising. Time. What's that? It's been some time. It's, it's been, been, been some been time. Around. Yeah. You, you have, yeah, you got some, you got some years of service on that, on that, on that front. But how would you say like the world of digital advertising specifically for home service businesses, how's that evolved? And what would you say are some of the key components to having a successful digital strategy? Yeah, I, I think it's caught up. I think the playing field is, is leveled. It has leveled significantly over the last five years, especially we've seen a couple of things happen. One, we've seen lots of interest from people outside of the home service space now come into the home service space. And then we've seen um, in tandem with this, uh, a lot of SaaS products and you know, really just tech uh, entering mm -hmm. into the space as well. And so what's happened is you've got people familiar with these commonly known growth principles and commonly known digital tactics from other experiences, now bringing those into the home service space. Then you've got more technology coming in. Nice job's a great example of this. You've got more technology and software coming in. And so we've kind of seen this leveling of the playing field. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a home service, a restaurant, or a, a fintech company. I mean, <laughs> the digital strategies that are in play uh, on some of these home service businesses, uh, especially some of these larger multiple location ones, would dwarf some of these other companies that, that you may be familiar with um, out in the ethos. And so I think that's the biggest takeaway for me is the playing field is now leveled. Um, you know, there, there shouldn't, I, I saw somebody on a pod the other day, it was a, a jobber pod actually, Mm -hmm. And um, they were talking about this notion that maybe home service or blue collar businesses kind of still get the, um, the, the secondhand treatment um, in the business realm. And I think that's increasingly becoming untrue if it ever was. And then the stigma mm -hmm. behind that is almost gone or evaporated at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's my takeaway from where I've seen trends going. Honestly, that's so encouraging. I think that a lot of people who are just wanting to start out and just you're like, okay, how am I going to compete with everyone else who's already out there? But it's like yeah. the fact that the the playing field is a lot more level. You're right about the stigma. I don't. I feel like nowadays more people are speaking about it. I think there's just more visible on social. I a lot of them have also been going viral as well. So it's like even if you are just you know a one man team, one person team, and or if you have like a bigger team, you're able to still go viral, get the same kind of business as someone else who may have been in the industry for, you know, 25, 30 years. And you're like, oh, I'm just starting out. But they're making content, they're posting, people are finding out about them. And it's just encouraging to see. Yeah, I mean, there's massive followings from these guys, too. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy I follow on Instagram, that lawn dude, I think, Rick oh. Ross of all people just like stumbled across him and had him actually. fly out. Yeah. Is that not bizarre? <laughs> that's that crazy. Um, wild. I mean, the playing field's level. It's level. Yeah. He sure. actually built like content around like how he's like, here, I'm going to, I'm going to quote Rick Ross for his yeah, It's crazy. That's right. That's and like incredible. everything is really content. And I think a lot of home service, like services in general are actually really aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> like they're like yeah. satisfying to watch. So I think that it's because they're the real ASMR. Yeah, yeah. But it's also like people like clean talk is like blowing up. Um, people love seeing people like wa like wipe something down. Like it just is mm. oddly satisfying. And like with ASMR that was like on the rise, it's just kind of like a visual ASMR version of like it. Like it's just a satisfying yeah. part of our brain that we didn't know. We I think I think even some of the content, like I, I've noticed, like some of the the home service professionals that are actually like stopping at the job, taking a second to actually explain what's going on. Yeah. It really gives like you know. The, the, the customer that's sitting at home thinking about, you know, I want to renovate or I want to do this or I want to change my roof, you know, giving them the ability to actually understand that market a lot more. Yeah. So it's becoming a lot more clear for that for people. That, or there's no like, there's no longer this like, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, because historically, I guess you could say in the home service space, you'd, the, the professional would show up and you just have to trust them. You'd be like, okay, I, I don't know what's going on here. But now, like, there's a lot of educational content out there. That's that's uh, that some some are really doing a great job with explaining like, here's the importance of this or here's what you should be looking for when you're getting this and that, which also helps reassure that that business is a business you can trust because they clearly know what they're talking about. They're not just you know making up numbers and giving you a quote that you have no idea how to how to <laughs> how to pick apart. You're like I don't yeah. know if I'm getting ripped off. I don't know if yes. this is a good quote. I don't know what's going on. 
Yeah. That's the authority piece. I mean, you've yeah. got to have authority in the space. And when we're talking about leveling the playing field, the people with authority are no longer the people that have been around for 25 years. Yes. Um, sure. They may have some still a lot of brand equity, but anybody can go out and get authority if they do a great job and they showcase and they get people to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's also like, I remember when I would get services done, or my mom would get services done. She would always be like walking around them, asking questions, like just figuring out what's going on. And I think that that's what that, that kind of content mode that you mentioned does for customers because it's like, okay, this is what I'm doing. And so it's not just other service providers who do that thing that can watch that and be like, oh, okay, that's how he fixed that. But it's also like, the people watching it that might be getting it done. like, oh, I was interested to know. I didn't know I needed to know how to fix the sink today, but now I know that. And I think knowledge sharing is great. I also think it's become part of the research process. If you're yeah. thinking of getting a job done, you're going to look at like, how are they doing it? What's going on? Yeah. The, the, the average consumer these days, like the, is, is like or the average customer these days wants to know more about what, what they're purchasing before they're purchasing, right? So even in the home service business, I think that plays a part that... You know, showing how why why this roof is being changed, and here's things to look for. Yeah. They're gonna look for that in content before they even call a roofer, right? So, yeah. Um, and, and people used to gatekeep a lot, I think, because they were nervous about like business being stolen from them. But it actually gives you more business because I just watched you do that whole thing, but I still don't know how to do it. I'm gonna call you to come do it for me, but because I want it done better than what. I, but it's good that I know. <laughs> like I'm happy I know it, but or I may know how to do this. And because I know how to do this, I absolutely do not want to do it. Yeah, um, that part. Please, please come do it for me. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, okay, so I want to ask you about fence posts. But yeah, so with fence posts, it you know currently generates or has generated, you know, over twenty five thousand leads, um, over three thousand five star reviews last year alone. So I wanted to ask you specifically, like, what specific strategies do you use to ensure that these leads? are high quality and they're not just, you know, you know, it's quantity versus quality kind of thing. And this is where like the raw authenticity comes into play because almost no percent of the time are we coming out of the gate and immediately generating 10 out of 10 quality leads. Um, It's just not the way it goes. It's an iterative process. Um, It's iterative, not only because um, every client is different, you know, that sort of deal, uh, but also because demos are different, right? Um, Mm -hmm. The metro area of Augusta is very different from the metro area of New York, which is different from Toronto and so on and so forth. Um, And then lastly, like algorithms change, especially on the SEO side. I mean, everybody got crushed with an update back in November and then again in March and some people benefited and some people didn't. And so all that's a long winded way of um, giving the raw, honest answer of it's an iterative process. Um, typically, it takes us a good three months. By month three, we're aiming for a 3x return on every dollar you spend um, with Fins Post and on ads with everything. Because by that point, we can pretty much say, hey, we either are profitable, 3x or beyond, or we will be, and it's going to take this much time. Before that, it's really tough to judge. And the way we get there is by recording our calls, is by having a feedback loop with any of the online, uh, like Calendly is a great tool for us. So when Mm -hmm. we have Calendly synced up, we know exactly how many appointments were scheduled and how many of them actually showed up. Um, And so we want to have those feedback loops in place so that by month three, we can, we can get there. Yeah. I love that. I think, I think a lot of times, you know, uh, people have this like instant, they think things are just quick, right? And the world of marketing is, you know, although it's a fast paced moving world, there's still, the optimization experience, like the optimization journey is a longer journey and you have to be willing to kind of commit to that journey because that's typically like, you know, the, uh, the, 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 most people think that, oh, I spent, I spent like, you know, a thousand dollars, I should be getting at least a thousand dollars worth of clients. Right. But sometimes it's not a, it's not an, an instant ROI on, on the first month or the first week or whatever it is. Right. So it is marketing is a long-term game. Like that is, that is one thing that, you know, People need to understand that it's not going to change. That's the way it's always going to be. And I think you may you hit it. You hit the the nail on the head there, with, especially with you know companies like Google and Facebook that change their algorithms. They 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 change them up and they do it on purpose because they're trying to you know rank things differently. So I think I think that's that's another thing that to kind of keep in mind. And, and I do think that your service provider, whoever whoever you have entrusted, delegated the authority, using that phrase again, to um, be the champion of your marketing strategy. 
they should be held accountable in the same way that an employee would be held accountable. That means you have to have the relationship with them enough to be able to do that. And so, you know, if that the company that you're working with doesn't allow for that relationship, you probably need to move on. Um, but mm -hmm. if, if you do have that relationship, they should be held accountable in the same way that an employee employee would. Um, and, and that is twofold. There's two sides to that. On one side, that, that employee should be expected to be generating results and contributing to the overall black line of the, the profitability of the company. On the flip side, it means that we know that there are going to be some down months, some up months, but growth consistently over time should be up and to the right. And that's really what we're aiming for. And that's why we do, uh, it's a soft guarantee, right? Of in three months, we want to have a three X return or better. Um, and if we don't, um, we have to have a great reason why and feel confident that we'll hit it or we need to part ways and it doesn't happen often, but when it does, we still get five star reviews from those clients because I mean, we're sticking to our guns and, and, mm -hmm. and our word there. Looking on the ad spend side, right? So you've, you've managed millions of dollars in ad spend and you know, what advice I guess would you give to a home service business when it comes to allocating their advertising budget? um efficiently because i think you know especially if these businesses don't have like millions of dollars for money they might be like hey i got three grand i can spend on marketing i have a thousand bucks i have five hundred dollars that's all i have you know i have a hundred dollars how do you know where to throw that throw that hundred dollars or that five thousand dollars um as a business owner great question um growth principles are are the same i've said that 17 times in this podcast too. Uh, but if, if we're looking at growth, um, first and growth as it pertains to a channel and ad spend and, and marketing dollars specifically, um, first thing we have to do is we have to prove that whatever allocation of uh, whatever dollar we spend on this specific channel, that it can actually, um, accomplish the conversion, the sale, the scheduled estimate, whatever. So that's proof stage. Second stage would be predictability. We have to prove that we can do that consistently over and over again. Third stage would be profitability. Can we do it over and over again at a profitable level? And then where everybody thinks they should be today is the scale stage, right? Like the to the moon stage. But you can't skip any of those steps. You can get there faster, but you can't skip any of them. And so my challenge to folks with limited marketing budgets is go stay in that proof stage uh, as long as it takes to validate a specific channel. Um, set a, a set amount of money. Don't put your whole budget into that thing. Go prove the channel first um, because otherwise you're going to be fishing in a bunch of different ponds and you may actually never get through those stages um, that are required to, to get there. Uh, the other thing I would say is that like, you know, if you've got a hyper limited marketing budget, your best bet may not actually be going out and paying for new customers to come to your door um, via digital channel. Uh, it may actually be Go get you a nice polo shirt and go do some door knocking if you're a home service business. That could be a great way to actually invest your first hundred dollars. Um, get a couple of polo shirts for you, um, your spouse or your employee and go drum up business that way. But work incrementally within your means and prove out whatever channel, um, air quotes, that, that you that you have going on uh, before you move on to the next one. Is there any amount of, I guess, like budget that you think is kind of not worth it? Like you might as well wait until you can get that a little bit higher. Like spending $50 a day on Facebook, do you think it does more, does it actually help or should you just save that? And then until your budget gets to be maybe a hundred dollars a day. Yeah. I think, um, everybody should start with Google in my opinion. Uh, everybody should start where their customers are. Um, if you've got a hundred bucks in a month, go get a nice job. Shameless plug, but like that, that's the first thing is go get more reviews. Um, you know, if, if you've got a thousand dollars in a month, $30 a day is the minimum amount I would recommend spending on Google and also the minimum amount I would recommend spending on, on mm -hmm. Facebook. Uh, but, but start there. That should be like your first milestone is can we allocate $30 a day in ad mm -hmm. spend, um, to uh, Google ads? Yeah, that's good. That's a good number. Cause I feel like it also is a little bit intimidating as well to know like, where do I even start? How much should I invest in this to make it, I guess, worth it to see some sort of return? Um, 
but no, you're right. Google local services ads, um, which is uh, an alternative Google product that we mentioned earlier, is also a great way to tiptoe your your way into these waters. And you actually don't pay until you get a lead in the door. Mm -hmm. So it's a pay per lead service. And you can dispute poor quality leads. Mm -hmm. Super easy to set up. You can do it yourself or you can have an agency do it, whatever. But it's a great way to kind of like tiptoe into this Google space um, if you don't have a ton of money. And you can set it up for like 150 bucks a week or something like that. That's perfect. That's some good advice. So speaking of poor quality leads, what do you think are some common mistakes that home service businesses make that lead to these poor quality leads? Um, And how can they avoid making them? A lot of times when people start getting into the um, further up in the, the customer journey funnel tactics, like Facebook and Instagram or TikTok ads or something like that, and we really see people losing control of their targeting. And when you lose control of your targeting, uh, you just you get all sorts of fluff in the mix. I think that's one side of the coin. I think the other side of the coin is not actually knowing if your leads are good quality or not, um, at least as far as where they're coming from. Uh, I think a lot of times people, home service business owners specifically, or especially, they rely on gut feeling for a lot. And Sometimes that's good. That's how they've gotten there. But a lot of times that's a bad way of, uh, of thinking. You may feel like your phone's ringing off the hook, but the actual appointments that you're booking are, are just, you know, you're wasting your, your estimator's mm-hmm. time going out. And so I think having a means of a feedback loop of knowing what is quality and what's not is the number one way you avoid bad quality leads because you can almost immediately say, hey, whatever you're doing, whoever's managing Google ads or Facebook ads, it's keeping us so busy and making us zero money. You have to stop. Um, that's an easy, easy ask. How can you tell what's a poor quality lead versus not like before it becomes too late? Yeah. Well, for one, I don't know if you can before it comes too late. I think like when they're, uh, there's the obvious ones, right? If they come through on a, on a spam uh, form or something and you know, it's like, okay, this is dot ru or dot something else email address. Um, we're, we're probably out on that. Um, that's a good indicator. The other one is, is if, you know, they, they call you, you don't get the phone call and then you call them back and it's like some disconnected number. It's another great indicator. Uh, but a lot of times people aren't finding out. And most of the time, a poor quality lead is really just somebody being a tire kicker. They actually may be a good quality lead, just not today and maybe not this year. Um, that's the number one source of the poor quality. Yeah, it's a good point. I think also also understanding like where these leads are coming from. You know what I mean? Like mm. they, how they find out about you and where they kind of came from, because that also helps you understand like when you're spending, you know, let's say a thousand bucks a month, thirty bucks a day, to kind of advertise. What is the cost of you landing a job? Right. So if, yeah. it might cost you a thousand bucks a month, but if you get one job, let's say it's a roofing company. It might cost you a thousand bucks a month, but that roof job is, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars depending on the size of the house. That's huge ROI, right? So it's just understanding like what is your what is your what is the return on your investment? What kind of return on investment are you actually looking for that kind of help you kind of balance those? Um I wanna ask you though, going back to content a little bit, um what types of content should you know home service businesses focus on creating? Um, to attract and engage like potential customers, you know what I mean? Like, like, how do you know? Like, what do you do? You go out and start doing TikTok videos. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Do you do you just focus on like building out a portfolio? Like, yeah, content is tough. I think every single person that um, there's probably a select few people actually that are just awesome. They just have content <laughs> ideas all the time. Uh, I don't know how many of those people are home service business owners, but. Regardless, if you are a home service business owner, go out and demonstrate the process. Go out and just record what you do on a daily basis. It's shocking how entertaining that is to the layperson, the person that doesn't do this every day. It's like, oh, this is what real people are doing, you know, and this is this is the before and this is the after. That type of content is engaging and people don't need it right then and there. Like, I don't need a new roof right now. But you know what? When I do need a new roof, that person that I saw that... Um, recorded this incredible drone footage shot of, you know, roofer Joe and roofer Bob on the roof doing whatever, like that's awesome. And we're going to give him a call because he has a drone. Um, I, I think stuff like that is, is great. Just demonstrating the process. Yeah. So satisfying. 
especially the, the soft washes, the pressure washes, those are the ones that get me. Yeah. Great. Yeah. The before and after is like the before and after stuff is gold. I love that mm-hmm. stuff. It's like so satisfying. You see like, Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love those. Great. I think Rossi also says something really cool there where it was, you know, you might not need a roofer today, but then when you do, you remember it. I think a lot of times we we want an immediate ROI. We like, I put this much money into it or mm-hmm. I posted this. I want a customer right away. And it's like a lot of times social media specifically is just mostly visibility at first just getting your name out there getting people to know that what you're doing and then eventually it could lead to a lead um and then and then a client but you're really just getting people out some people who have millions of followers doesn't mean they have millions of clients it just means that they have really good content that people want to follow but that also does help when they have a client i go and see your socials and i see your posting and i like your content i'm more likely to become a client yeah it's 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 interesting. Like I have, I have one of my friends. His his brother owns like a interlocking paving company, and he's been like he posts on Instagram this and that, right? And it's just like he's been posting like these videos, like these explainer videos, like here's what went wrong at this job, and here's why we're fixing it. And he's getting like hundreds of thousands of views, and I'm like, this guy's getting brand awareness like crazy just by sitting there. You're on the job, anyways. Like you're doing the job. Stop for like five minutes, like record a quick video. And then post it right it's not like they're like massively edited or like the contents like there's no like animations and things in that and the other like it's just a straight video of the guy on his phone just here's what's ha- here's what here's what happened here's how we're gonna fix it and it's on it's, the flip it's- side you would be shocked at how easy it is to find somebody super willing to edit your videos for relatively yeah. inexpensively yeah. it's just like the barrier to entry to content creation is so so low. yeah so I was just about to ask, what would you say to someone who says, like, I have no time to invest in my social media? Yeah. Oh, man. I don't know. This is preaching to the <laughs> choir here um, for, for myself. Uh, but, yeah, like, just do it. You've got to do it. Just stop complaining and just do it. Um, get out your phone or find somebody that's willing to get out their phone. Actually, somebody that's already on their phone that you've been trying to get off their phone, you should give this job there to. There you go. Just yeah. to say, <laughs> get back hey, to work. like, yeah, come come record this thing. Um, I don't know. Like the just do it thing is is really it though. I mean, it doesn't, in the beginning, every single person's content is terrible. I mean, it is just awful. You have to start somewhere. And when you, the more you do it, like you just perfect the craft and right. perfecting the craft doesn't look the same as everybody else's, but you get better at it over time. So you got to start. Yeah, for sure. I definitely, I also agree with like hiring someone to do the things that you might not mm. have time to do because it is important for you to have this. So it, you might not be even someone there, but if you get the content and then you give it to someone else, then they can edit it for you. They, they can post and schedule it for you yeah. because you're going to have to do it. And I know it's really daunting because it's a lot of work, but if you just start, like you mentioned, maybe just start by taking some before and after photos, then videos, and then slowly you get to like also consuming the kind of content that you think you want to create mm. will also help you because then you're like, okay, Ooh, how call. did I, how did they film this? And then you can get inspiration on how you can, you like not imitation, don't do the same thing, but you can get inspiration on how you should do it for yourself. Tanya, that's a great call. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been guilty or have done that uh, myself where, you know, just finding what, how are other people explaining not very visually appealing things in a visual manner, I think is the the trick. You you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, So for some of these home service businesses that are just starting out with digital marketing in general, what do you think are the first three steps that they should take to start seeing results? Yeah. If you're on a, on a shoestring budget or no budget and you're trying to increase visibility, the very first thing you should do is go out and claim your Google business listing. Super easy to do. We actually have a playbook. Happy to share it um, if you'd like. Uh, second thing that we need to do is we need to somehow take inventory of our entire past and current customer database and go send them a, an email. Um, whether it's individualized or massive or bulk, whatever, go send them an email and just ask them for a five-star review linking back to the Google business profile that you you just requested. Um, and then the last ingredient here to increasing visibility is like we were just talking about, uh, just start making content. I think that's 
that's a critical thing. So claim your Google business listing, go ask for reviews and start making content. That's a great way on a shoestring budget to almost immediately ramp up your, your visibility for your home service business. Yeah, that's amazing. It's not even just for people who are just starting out. That's like, if you aren't already doing these and you're already, you know, you already have business and you think, oh, I'm super busy. I don't need to focus on my marketing. Start with these and you'll be even busier. (laughs) Hire someone else. (laughs) You can scale. You can scale. Roz, I'll ask one question. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about today that you think we should be talking about? You guys are great. We've covered a lot of stuff. (laughs) We have Uh, covered a lot, actually. (laughs) Yeah, this is some really good stuff. Um, I, I am so thankful for a uh, nice job. I mean, the, the impact it's had on my business specifically, and then as a result, um, all of our all of our clients' businesses, um, it, it's integral to what we do. And I think it's at the heart of what Finspost is all about, and that is truly trying to break down some of these walls that have actually been created by um, digital tools. Yeah. And we want our home service businesses that are the backbones and lifebloods of our local communities to thrive so that our local communities can thrive. And uh, that's our mission. And we're hopeful that we can see that come to fruition. That's amazing. I love it. Where can, where can people find you, Ross? Yeah, go check us out uh, on Instagram at uh, Instagram.com backslash fencepost.co. And then also at fencepost.co, you can get a free assessment. Um, That's fencepost.co and uh, fill out uh, the form, get a, a video assessment from yours truly or somebody on my team, and we'll take a look at low hanging fruit options. Yes, go look at the content Amazing. that Ross doesn't like to create. <laughs> Please do that. Good heavens. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much for joining us, Ross. This conversation was so tangible. A lot of tangible tips in here. So great to have you on. Um, yeah, is there anything else you want to say? Thanks for having me. This has been wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Roz. Yeah, this is fantastic. And that wraps up today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. As always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media at Built by Me Podcast. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a five-star rating. Until next time, keep building.